Hello, YouTube. My name is Alan, and it's that time once again. Let's talk metal. All right. As I'm recording this, I'm still dealing with some allergy issues. So apologies if my voice is a little bit off. Got hit pretty good by allergies. I always have a little bit of them every fall, but this year has been especially bad. Anyway, tonight I'm going to follow up on my recent video about some different variants of albums. In the previous video, I showed a lot of new wave of British heavy metal LPs and 12 inch EPs that came with different versions of the cover, uh, things like that. I'm not doing colored vinyl versions in these videos. That's kind of you know its own little topic, which we'll tackle with other videos. But for this video, I wanted to follow up with some of the seven inch variants from the new wave of British heavy metal. Now, at the end of the last video, I had talked about the first Tokyo Blade LP and some of the changes that were made when Combat issued it in the US. I meant to add one little tidbit at the end of that, but again, I could feel myself kind of getting clogged up uh, with snot, and so I needed to wrap that video up kind of quickly. But something else I wanted to point out, there was also a kind of interesting variant about the second Tokyo Blade album, uh, which is called Night of the Blade. This is the CD reissue that was done on High Voltage. Uh, high Voltage always did really nice CD reissues with lots of bonus tracks, good liner notes and such. Um, Night of the <coughs> Blade is, in my opinion, a little bit of a step down from the first album. There was a big lineup change at the last minute where the band fired their original vocalist, Alan Marsh, and brought in a new vocalist named Vic Wright. And you know, while he's not a bad singer, you know, he definitely has a different sound. And it's you know, not a coincidence that around this time, the band started moving towards a little bit more of a commercial, you know, maybe MTV, uh, slightly sleaze-leaning uh, direction in their sound, which you know, continued much more noticeably on the subsequent albums. So this album you know, still has some decent tracks on it, but you can tell the band is moving away from their early sound. What's interesting about this is that when High Voltage reissued Night of the Blade, they also reissued it in a different version. This is the original recordings from the studio that were done with Alan Marsh singing on the tracks. Again, it was a very last minute decision to pull the plug on Marsh and bring in a new vocalist. Most of the album had been recorded already. And so High Voltage, you know, got the original tapes. And so you can then hear what the album would have sounded like with Alan Marsh still in the band, as opposed to the released version that had Vic Wright in the band. So kind of, you know, a cool little variant there, even though it wasn't an original release back in the day. Um, and yeah, for my money, I think the Alan Marsh version is a little bit better. Was Marsh the greatest vocalist ever? No. Was he the greatest vocalist in the new wave of British heavy metal? No. Um, but, you know, I thought he had a solid enough voice, and I do prefer him over uh, Vic's voice on that. Again, it's not that Vic's a bad singer. It's just a different, you know, his voice is suited to a different style. He would have fit in much more into sort of like, you know, an L.A. glam sleaze band, I think, rather than a band like Tokyo Blade that had established themselves as a very, you know, traditional sounding new wave of British heavy metal force. All right. So now let's move into some variants among seven inch releases from the new wave of British heavy metal. And we're going to start with more Tokyo Blade, because why not? I can always kind of like them. Tokyo Blade started their existence under the name Genghis Khan, which was a name adopted by a lot of aspiring bands. So they realized, you know, pretty soon that they were going to have to switch to something more unique which is where they came up with the name Tokyo Blade. Um, but that name change was kind of a last second deal as well, because they had already pressed up some vinyl under the name Genghis Khan. They had uh, the seven inch release called Double Dealing. And the name is, you know, sort of a little pun because this was actually a two single pack. You got two seven inch singles uh, in this release. Um, you got one of them had If Heaven is Hell backed with Highway Passion, and the other has Midnight Rendezvous backed with Mean Streak. All really good tracks. So yeah, they already pressed this up, you know, with Genghis Khan on the cover and with 
Genghis Khan on the labels. Uh, I've got both records in one sleeve here. I don't really know why, but so yeah, you can see here's uh, one of the singles and then here's the other single with the Genghis Khan labels. Uh, it's a little hard to see probably in camera. The labels have like a very, very light bluish color to them. They almost look white, but they're just very faint blue actually. So <clears throat> the band had these pressed up, uh, ready to start circulating. And then at this last second, they figure, you know what? You know, all these Genghis Khans are getting kind of mixed up in the public mind. We need to establish a you know, more unique identity. Let's make a change. And so they did. And you know, the story goes that essentially the double dealing pack was pulled at the very last second and split up into two separate singles, new picture sleeves, new artwork was come up. So it wasn't a double pack anymore. Um, so if Heaven is Hell got this picture sleeve with the new Tokyo Blaze logo and the little demon uh, mascot there, and they had to quickly print up new labels as well, so that now the labels would identify them as Tokyo Blade. It's identified as being on Blade Records this time. But if you look at the labels carefully, you can tell they're just pasted over the original pale blue Genghis Khan labels. Maybe a little hard to see, but let me see if I can get it to show up on camera. You can see a little bit down here at the edge of the vinyl where you know, the sticker is overlapping on top of another sticker right there. And you can also see, if you look very closely in some places, uh, right over here, you can get a sense of it. That you can see there's a little bit of the print from the original Genghis Khan label is showing up through the white Blade Records label. So it's the same record as the Genghis Khan printing. They just took these, slapped new labels onto the center of them, and put them into these new picture sleeves. And so they did that for both of the singles. Now, I only have one of the two. I've got the If Heaven is Hell single I, with Highway Passion on it. I don't have the Mean Streak 7-inch. It's one of the last sort of big items on my want list from the new wave of British heavy metal. I've always wanted to get both of these, and I've never been able to find the other one. Now, <clears throat> making the story a little more complicated, because it needs to be more complicated, Hold on there. In the 1990s, a bunch of copies of the Genghis Khan thing showed up. And it was uh, obviously a pretty hard one to find. These really, if they even got released onto the market, they were immediately pulled. A very small quantity ever got out into the wild with the Genghis Khan labels. But then in the 1990s, uh, folks associated with a British uh, vinyl mail order company uh, suddenly had copies of the Genghis Khan double dealing for sale, a lot of them. Turned out what had happened was they had found a bunch of these leftover picture sleeves. So the picture sleeves were original artifacts from the early 80s, but the singles they were pairing up with the release just have plain white labels on them. Anytime you see plain white labels, that should always set off a little bit of an alarm bell that you might be looking at some kind of repressing bootleg, which is what was going on. The picture sleeves were originals, but the singles were not originals. So you'll see some copies of the Genghis Khan thing floating around. But yeah, if it ever makes mention of having white labels, plain labels, that is not original vinyl. If you're wanting to collect the original thing, that's not what you're interested in. You know, again, this one that I've got is one of the originals. I've shown it to multiple collectors, verifying that it's not some kind of weird, you know, boot or pressing. And now this is the thing. So again, should look like this. Printed labels, again, a very faint light blue coloration to it. I'm sure it's not showing up good there. Even just under normal light in the room, at first glance, it looks white. Uh, but yeah, it's very faintly blue. And that is what you would be looking for, right? Same thing happened to the Tokyo Blade singles. I've had several people over the years offer me the other Tokyo Blade single I need. And the first question I always ask is, what do the labels look like? 
And every damn time they write back and say, well, it's got plain white labels. And I say, thank you very much, not interested. Uh, you want the Tokyo Blade single to have the printed blade label. And you can should, again, on close inspection, be able to see a little bit of the print showing through, a little bit of the overlap on the sticker. That's what the originals look like. So yeah, collecting Tokyo Blade vinyl is hard. Mm, nobody told me it was gonna be hard when I bought the 79 revisited compilation back in 91 or 92. But let's move on. Enough about Tokyo Blade. We've talked about, good grief, Tokyo Blade for 10 minutes. Let's talk about some other releases. All right, here's a single, it's very well known, very well loved among the Wafer Bridge Heavy Metal fans. It's the Black Axe single, Highway Rider and Red Lights, both excellent tracks. This band had a lot of momentum when this came out. It sold incredibly well, but it took them much too long to get a follow up release out. Uh, we're talking a couple of years went by. They inexplicably changed their name to Wolf. This was apparently done at the direction of Chrysalis Records. This was a band that got picked up by a major label. You know, looked like they were heading to the top. And, you know, the major label heads were like, hey, why don't you come up with a much better name? We've got it. Wolf. Because that's very uh, generic and uninspiring. Hmm. Yeah. To make it worse, there was already a new wave of British heavy metal band named Wolf. So now all of a sudden you had them getting confused with the other wolf, which there was really no connection. So yeah, things went downhill from there. They eventually did get uh, a full album put out on Mausoleum Records, uh, Edge of the Worlds, great album, a lot of cool tracks on it, but it came out, you know, I think about four years after the single, it, it was too late, you know, the ship had already sailed. Anyway, something I've noticed on copies of the Black Axe single is there's a slight variation on the center labels. Again, this single sold quite well reportedly and had to be repressed a couple of times to keep up with demand. And I've noticed um, a little difference between two copies I've got. Uh, on this one, the print on the label, it's black, but it's not very dark. And the center hole is also got you know this particular cutout pattern, which you see on some singles from that era. Different copy I own, however, uh, this one I just don't have the picture sleeve for. It would have come with the picture sleeve originally. The font on the center label of this one is very dark. It's very bold black font. So it's a little different in the pressing there. And the center label doesn't have that same punch out pattern. This is a lot more like the punch out pattern you typically see from records. I don't know if it's an American thing or if this became more common yeah, in the 80s. I've really only seen this punch out pattern on a few British singles here and there. So maybe it was a, just a difference related to that somehow. But anyway, there is a little difference there from one version of the single to the other. I'm assuming one of these was pressed you know, in one batch. And when they went back to make another batch, you know, there's just a slight variation to those center labels. So yeah, a little bit of difference between copies of the Black Axe single. I have no idea if one is more rare than the other. I don't think it's the kind of thing many people would go out and actively collect. It's a pretty minor difference. I only know it because I own both of them. I had the copy without the picture sleeve first, bought another copy later that had a sleeve with it. And as soon as I saw it, I'm just like, that doesn't quite look the same as my other copy. I compared them and lo and behold, a little difference there. All right. Got a few more to work through here. This one I uh, showed off on one of the recent streams that I do over on the Marty Worm channel. Uh, Marty and I, of course, do the heavy metallurgy streams on Friday nights. A lot of fun, should check it out. I showed this one off when we were talking with uh, Philip from the Chromium Dioxide channel. We were talking about you know monsters in heavy metal. And it immediately made me think of the Target UK single. Uh, this came out in 1985 on Flying V Records. 85 is getting a little late for New Wave of British Heavy Metal, I realize, but we're going to call it New Wave of British Heavy Metal for now. One of the songs on here is called Alive and Kicking. It's got a Frankenstein theme going on to it. And this one, most references you look at, uh, show this you know, relatively simple monochrome sleeve. It's got you know, the band name, the little target or logo. It's simple, but effective connecting the art to the band name. 
you know, this is the kind of new wave of British heavy metal sleeve that some people you know, kind of decry for being very simple and uninspired. But I actually think they were pretty clever in being able to use these simple designs to convey the point and connect it to the band name. So anyway, it's a decent little single. I like it. Uh, it's rather American sounding. Uh, years after I got that one, and that one was a pain to find. It took me a long time to track down that copy. Crossed it off the want list, very happy. And then years later, another copy showed up for sale on eBay. And when I glanced at it, I was like, what the hell is that? Because it didn't look anything like my copy. The picture sleeve is very different. The whole Target UK logo is just shrank into one corner. It's got the title alive and kicking down the side. And it's got a picture plastered on the front, uh, sort of a bad photocopy rendition of Lon Chaney in the old Phantom of the Opera movie production from 1925. Now, why did they use Phantom of the Opera when the song's supposed to be more about Frankenstein? Because reasons, who knows? But yeah, very different picture sleeve. Um, this drove me nuts. It's like, what the hell is with that? But looking into it, it's like, yeah, it actually came with two different picture sleeves. I have no idea which is supposedly the first version or the second, or if they released side by side, you know, the same Flying V record label, same tracks. But uh, this one shows up with two different picture sleeves. Uh, neither version shows up very often in my experience. This one shows up a lot less often. So this seems to be the rarer version. I don't know if they were printed in the same quantity and this one just didn't circulate as much or what, but yeah, you don't see as many of the Cheney picture sleeves as you do the plain black one. All right, <clears throat> moving on to our next version. This is a variant that's pretty well known to new wave of British heavy metal fans. And it relates to one of the finest new wave of British heavy metal singles ever. One of the first videos I did for this channel was you know five of the best new wave of British heavy metal singles. And this is one I featured in that very first video and deservedly so. It is the Sweet Savage single, Take No Prisoners Back With Killing Time. Uh, you know, incredible band. It's a real shame these guys didn't get a little further back in the day. Their early recordings, like this single, the compilation appearances they put in, uh, they really had the blueprint nailed down, not just for, you know, modern heavy metal and the new wave of British heavy metal sense, but yeah, this is, you know, showing the blueprints for thrash metal, uh, almost for speed metal at times. These guys already had the formula worked out here, you know, in 1980, 1981 timeframe. Uh, the deal with this one, and just for fun, this copy was autographed by Vivian Campbell, but uh, there's two variants to this. Some copies of the vinyl have the labels printed in red font, as shown here. This is the first pressing of the single. And again, the single was popular enough that it got repressed. Second batch was made. Same picture sleeve, but the second version had black font instead of red font. Um, it's never been clear to my knowledge like how far apart these were pressed, if there's literally pressed sort of back to back, or you know, if there's a little bit more of a gap in time and these were pressed maybe a year or so later. Don't know, doesn't really matter. Uh, they're both you know, legit pressings of the single, so you can get it with black or red font. And why do I own both versions? Because the single's just that damn good. Uh, it really is one of the gems of the movement. All right, a couple more to go. So next up's a very obscure band that was actually a little bit ahead of the new wave of British heavy metal game because they got their single out in 1979, um, right as things were just starting to gel on the new wave of British heavy metal scene. It's a band called Triarchy. And they made two uh, seven-inch releases. The second one had three tracks on it. <coughs> oh, excuse me. But this first one only has two. Um, the first one pairs the tracks Save the Con with Juliet's Tune. Really nice pair of songs. And it came in this, you know, very fetching picture sleeve, you know, shows, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, warlord rider on the horse and all that. Uh, it's kind of a thick, crude uh, cardboard 
print on the sleeve. So it shows wear really easy. It's hard to find copies of this that are really, really pristine and mint. And it was pressed up on the little SRT record label. Right. So SRT was a long running imprint in the UK to my knowledge. Uh, you see a lot of older 70s singles and stuff on SRT. I think it's connected to a particular studio. Could be wrong about that. But anyway, um, <clears throat> surprisingly, the Triarchy single did get a second pressing on direct records. So you'll also see this version with, again, same song, Save the Con, backed with Juliet's Tomb. Both songs are pretty cool. The band used, you know, some keyboard synth effects, which are a little rare for uh, New Wave of British Heavy Metal at the time. And again, this version, obviously, different labels, didn't come in a picture sleeve. Uh, their second release was also on direct records. So I'm guessing that when they put that one out on direct, direct also decided that they wanted to redo the first Triarchy release as well. Some copies of the three track EP had like a promotional picture sleeve, just a few copies, you know, had a very crude sleeve that was thrown in when it was, you know, sent out to some labels for interest, but it wasn't widely distributed with a picture sleeve. But yeah, the Triarchy single, a uh, very cool one, like it quite a bit, and worth checking out. They have gotten the anthology treatment, so you can hear some of their stuff relatively easy these days. All right, got one last one to show off here. And this one is another really strong single from the heyday of New Wave of British Heavy Metal. It's by a band called Bashful Alley. Kind of a strange name, but I thought it was kind of cool. Uh, they released this single called Running Blind, back with My, My, My. Both tracks are very good, nice, energetic stuff. Good guitar work on it. Uh, nice hand-drawn sort of portraits of the band members. A lot of New Wave of British Heavy Metals did this kind of picture sleeve. Again, some people think they look kind of plain and simple. I think they actually look quite nice done this way. And this signal was released in this kind of, um, you know, it's kind of an orangey yellow picture sleeve. I've heard it described as being sort of like a canary yellow, but I don't think it's really quite that bright. But, you know, very distinctive color to the picture sleeve. And it was put out on a little label called L.E.J. And again, this is one that was linked to a particular recording studio in the U.K. Uh, L.E.J., a lot of the singles on this label have become very collectible over the years. They put out several very good bands recorded there, but the singles tended to come out in pretty limited quantities. Uh, the Bashful Alley single is actually probably one of the easier ones to find on the LEJ label. So yeah, they printed it up this way, but it turned out that they, as they were sleeving them up, getting them ready to ship out, they didn't have quite enough copies of the picture sleeve. And so the last you know, few copies, they had to run off a, another batch of picture sleeves, but they didn't have the same colored paper to use. And so those last copies, Again, still the same single on LEJ, but they got put into picture sleeves just done on plain white stock, like this one here. And these, the white version is really tough to come by. I didn't even know it existed for years until a copy showed up on eBay one day and just floored me because I was like, that's not the right color for the picture sleeve. My initial thought was that it was just a photocopy of the picture sleeve, but it turned out it was coming from one of the band members uh, who was selling it. And so in chatting with him on email, I got the full story that, yeah, they just ran out of picture sleeves, needed to put the last, uh, he didn't know the exact numbers, but he was saying, you like, you know, there may have been you know, a few, couple of dozen copies left or something. And so we just went back. They were out of yellow paper, like, well, fine, just put them on white. We don't care. We got to get these things sleeved up and ready to go. So yeah, very few copies uh, ever got circulated in these white picture sleeves on LEJ. So cool little variation there. And again, this wasn't the band trying to make some kind of, you know, die hard limited edition or uh, make everybody on Discogs go nuts with FOMO and printing only you know, 12 copies or whatever. It's just like, huh, don't have enough picture sleeves. Better make some more. Hmm, no more yellow paper? Yeah, use white. Who cares? <laughs> and nowadays, it's you know, a really cool variant. But wait, there's more to the Bashful Alley story. Uh, the single did get reissued on a different label. 
So some copies of the single are on graffiti records. This uh, was done after the fact. And those copies have the same picture sleeve, but it's in kind of a you know very tan, uh, very pale yellowish picture sleeve. Same image, but with a different color scheme yet again. So the Bashful Alley one has three variants. So yeah, again, the originally it came you know, with the you know, brighter, stronger yellow picture sleeve. The last copies from that pressing were thrown into white picture sleeves. And when it was reissued on graffiti, it was put in these kind of tan colored picture sleeves. So there you go. And why do I own all three versions? Because I'm a sick little monkey. I think we've established that long, long ago when it comes to my collection. But again, it is a cool single. And they do have uh, an anthology that was put out as well. Their anthology got put out some time back. I think it was in the early 2000s. It's called It's About Time. And there's a lot of other good numbers on there. Um, they had um, a lot of stuff, obviously pretty talented band that could have gone further if they'd gotten you know, the right break or the right push. Okay, that is the last one I've got to show tonight. Now, there are certainly other variants among New Wave of British Heavy Metal singles that I either just didn't think about to pull out and show that I don't own or that I don't even know about. So let's talk metal in the comments down below. Tell me, what are some of your favorite variants that came up among the seven inch releases? It can be New Wave of British Heavy Metal or even other styles of heavy metal. Doesn't matter at all. But what are some cool ones that you've come across uh, that you really like? Maybe you own them or maybe you've got one version and you're still trying to track down that other version like that Tokyo Blade single that continues to slip right through my fingers. One day, I'll get it crossed off the want list. But until then, I'm going to sign off. Everybody take care, and as always, keep banging your heads.